So today we're focusing on businesses that are not working out as hoped, uh, whether conceptually or financially. Perhaps there were design errors that prevent guests from feeling relaxed or staff from doing their jobs properly. Or maybe the financial projections were a bit too rosy and the bar is having trouble hitting the numbers necessary to keep the lights on. There are very few bars that have the luxury of surviving as lost leaders, vanity projects, or showcases for other endeavors. At some point, your investors or the bank will come knocking. So first, a bit of backstory about how this presentation came about. Uh, Karina, my partner, and myself were guest bartending at a five-star hotel in Beijing last year. Uh, in the middle of one of the slower shifts, we received the latest in a stream of uh, disappointing night reports from our bar Glass back in Paris. Uh, meanwhile, we're looking at Facebook, and all my friends, most of my friends on Facebook are industry, uh, bar industry. You see one status update after another, event invites, awards, product launches, etc. And me being predisposed to hopelessness, pessimism, desperation, I became a bit frustrated that Glass was not uh, living up to the potential. So after going on a short rant to Karina, I took a breath and thought about it for a moment. Should we take these social network humble brags at face value? I'm far from the most widely traveled bartender, but I've had the privilege of visiting um, many of the top bars around the world, and I'm consistently surprised by how slow some of them are. And social media, uh, especially has a funny way of amplifying your insecurities. It's obviously unhealthy to put so much stock in what you see online, especially when it's a barrage of backslapping, accepting awards, new projects. And of course, posting pictures of an empty bar on Instagram won't bring in the crowd, so I understand where it's coming from. So today we're gonna try to shake off some of this insecurity, uh, some of the taboos surrounding unmet financial expectations, stumbles, uh, partner disputes, dead ends, career pivots. Our hope is that by beginning to speak candidly about these subjects, we can get a conversation started within the industry and inspire others to do the same. It's only gonna become stronger if we talk about our failures as well as our successes. Um, some of the best advice that I've had has been sharing a beer late night with some uh, other bar owners, other colleagues, and they're not really afraid to talk about their, their difficulties at those kind of times, so we're trying to bring it more about into the open. Speaking of our own experience, what has worked, what hasn't, and why we think this is so will helpfully, uh, hopefully help you avoid some of our missteps. And I'm super eager to hear what the others have to say. I'm definitely going to be taking notes uh, for some of our bars back in Paris. So introducing uh, the people on stage with me today, Matt Snap is the uh, beverage director for Fox Restaurant Concepts. Uh, they're based in Phoenix, Arizona. They currently have 44 um, restaurants and they're going to be over 50 by the end of the year and Matt is going to be talking to us about their Phoenix restaurant Little Cleo's Seafood Legend. Julie Reiner of course needs no introduction, New York based owner and operator of the award winning bars Flatiron Lounge, Clover Club and Leyenda as well as being the author of the book Craft Cocktail Party. She'll be discussing her now shuttered uh, Tribeca modern tropical bar Lanny Kai. And finally, we have Henrik Steen Peterson. He's the founder of Moltke's Bar, as well as Copenhagen, Copenhagen Spirits and Cocktails Bar Show. He's a spirits and cocktails educator and uh, author of the soon-to-be-published Art of the Simple Cocktail. You have all of our email addresses, websites, and online uh, what is it? Instagram if you'd like to get in touch. Uh, me, I'm the guy in the middle here. My two uh, smiling as always. Uh, with my two partners, Adam and Karina. Uh, we run a company called Quixotic Projects, which is the uh, parent company of four F&B establishments in Paris, uh, Candelaria, Glass, Le Marie Celeste, and Hero. Uh, we have 53 people working with us now, and we've been lucky enough to have um, some international recognition by World's 50 Best Bars, Tales of the Cocktail, etc. cetera. Um, Candelaria here is our first bar. It's how we got started in the industry. Uh, it's a taquery and cocktail bar opened in March 2011 in the Marais in Paris. And it was more or less an immediate success, uh, really embraced by the community of local galleries, boutiques, and uh, regulars that had followed us from our previous employment. We didn't really have too much competition at the time. It was the only cocktail bar in the area. And we were lucky enough to be nominated at Tales and get on the world's 50 best list uh, quite quickly. 
So this allowed Karina and, I, and myself to get out from behind the bar after about six months. We'd been working full time until then, uh, bartending. And we paid back our investors within 11 months. So pretty successful. Um, we never had the idea to open multiple locations, um, but the warm reception that Candelaria had, as well as uh, the great team we had in place, allowed us to step back and have some free time and uh, get, our, get our ideas flowing. So did, having this relatively successful bar right out of the gate to cloud our judgment cause us to paint an overly rosy financial picture on our other um, venue, no doubt. And while everyone on the stage has been successful at many points in their career, I'm sure they'll first be the first to agree that success does not beget success. Uh, it, help, it definitely helps you put, uh, put you on the right path. And your customer base, press contacts, and financial support that you've had until then will definitely uh, help you launch your other ventures. But this goodwill can only last so long, and at some point, you'll need to back it up with substance. So today, I'm going to talk. Uh, I'm going to focus on our second venue, Glass, uh, opened at the end of September 2012. And despite it being unfinished at the time of opening, which I'll go through a little bit later, we really thought we had a hit on our hands. Uh, the first nights were pretty crazy. People were dancing on the banquettes. Um, loud music, everyone was gushing over how much fun they had and posting pictures online and everything else. So the first six months it was working pretty well in terms of revenue. But we noticed that uh, the guests were not returning, especially our regulars from Candelaria. Uh, we weren't meeting their expectations. They really thought it was going to be kind of a Candelaria 2.0. And it wasn't meeting our expectations either. Uh, it wasn't really fitting the rock and roll concept that we had um, opened with. The DJ selection wasn't great. Our opening bar manager turned out to be a disaster. So heading into the summer of 2013, we could see the monthly revenue steadily declining until it stabilized at just under 40K a month. Not great. Uh, so in the spirit of transparency, I'm going to illustrate in concrete terms what I mean by when I say it's not working on a fundamental level uh, by sharing some general numbers. Obviously, these are not the full picture, but you'll get an idea. There's much more to accounting than just uh, the baseline numbers. So you see, we got our labor costs pretty much under control, beverage cost as well. And the revenue, however, has stayed stable month monthly uh, over the past four years. We haven't really been able, it was lower this year, but we got, um, we were, sorry, uh, we were closed for a month for renovations. And you can see at the bottom, we have been losing money year over year. This is more of an accounting uh, anomaly than, than a huge profit. So it's not a, great, not a great situation. So I'm going to talk you through three issues that we've identified over the years uh, that we think cause this. First is locational discord between the concept and the chosen neighborhood. The second is inflexibility, both at the outset with our founding idea and by trying to dictate how the bar evolved. And the third is the designers hijacking control and not listening to what we wanted and us being too inexperienced to, uh, to speak against it. There are several bars that we could have opened in the space, and we probably ended up with the one that's the most difficult to make succeed. These three issues have manifested in stagnant revenue despite us trying to remedy them as best we could on a slim to non-existent budget. So I'll try to explain each one for you. First, the location. This is how the bar looked when we, when we purchased it. Uh, we chose Pigalle as the area. It's a legendary nightlife neighborhood uh, made famous after World War II when there's American GI stations just out of Paris. They used to come to this neighborhood uh, to have fun on the weekends. It's a home of the Moulin Rouge, uh, lots of sex clubs, dirt bags everywhere, uh, quote unquote hostess bars, which were basically fronts for uh, prostitution. And at the time, a handful of cafes that had been taken over by uh, a younger generation and that were attracting the same kind of cool young crowd that we were looking for. So hostess bars were falling out of fashion. The uh, women working inside were pushing 60s, so you can imagine that their business was not going great. Uh, so we liked, we found one we liked on a, on a sketchy dead block at the time. It's not the same now. Uh, we made an offer and we took it over in June of 2012 and opened three months later. So in opening glass, we 
did the miraculous and managed to alienate uh, the two main groups who we were expecting to form our core clientele. Um, first, our regulars from Candelaria who were expecting, like I said, Candelaria number two, just in a different area. Um, not necessarily Mexican theme, but something similar in terms of vibe, decor, complexity of cocktails. Uh, Parisians at this time had a very um, certain idea of how a cocktail bar was supposed to look and feel, and glass was definitely not it. And looking back, this wouldn't have been a terrible idea <clears throat> because we were essentially trying to open an elevated dive bar in a neighborhood full of dive bars. Uh, an unapologetically um, higher-end cocktail bar would have easily stood out, and we would have cornered the growing market of young professionals moving to the neighborhood. And the second group that didn't understand really what we were trying to do uh, were the locals, the crowd that I'd mentioned before, um, 18 to 28 year old students, artists, musicians, who are accustomed to cheap subpar beer and wine and no doormen hassling you outside uh, to put your cigarette out and all this. So we stood out for our higher prices, unfortunately. Um, we're trying to, you know, give a little bit more quality. Our main beer on tap was Brooklyn Lager. We're charging seven years a pint for that. Uh, they can get four to five year Cronenbergs um, down the block. And it was much more difficult to convince this clientele to open their wallets and pay uh, for a bit more quality. So they ended up liking the late night party vibes, but they would come to us at 2 a.m. already drunk, and then we just end up kicking them out for doing drugs in the bathroom. Um, so it would have been better to open this bar probably near Candelaria, where we would stand out. It's the opposite of Candelaria and Pigal opening glass in the Marais, which is much more upscale, chic neighborhood, and then it would have really differentiated ourselves uh, among the guests. So the second issue is inflexibility with the original concept, which uh, came before the space. Um, we wanted to do a dive bar with a kind of an artsy edge modeled after um, Passerby in New York, where Adam had worked, Toby Cicchini, about 10 years earlier and a bar that I worked at called Orchard Bar in New York. Uh, we wanted to have a strong beer program, which was rare in Paris at the time, uh, affordable cocktails, around eight to 10 euros, simple highballs, slushy machine, on tap, fun, easy to comprehend, quick to serve. Uh, we had, had hot dogs, um, an industry night on Sundays, which actually ended up being probably one of the most successful things. Uh, we do a 15% discount for anyone in the bar industry on Sundays, and uh, that continues to this day and it works quite well. And two main things were we wanted to fully soundproof so we could open late. Bars need to close at 2 a.m. in Paris generally. Uh, and a light up dance floor. So we could have done all of this except for the last two if we had uh, the vision or the guts to, to trash the original idea or modify the original idea for the space we ended up taking. So the bar when we, when we bought it, um, it was run down, but it was quite charming, old prostitute bar, original details that had been there for about 75 years. Um, the furniture wasn't great, the walls were covered in fabric, and we did find some uh, condom wrappers on the floor when we were cleaning it out. But it had these beautiful old window panes, nice facade, it's it quite nice. But unfortunately, it lost all its original charm due to the soundproofing. None of the original details were able to be kept because we had to do the box within a box uh, in order to soundproof to the level necessary. You see the walls are quite nice and the ceiling and everything, uh, which of course came at a huge cost. Um, so another outcome we've always wondered about since then is if it wouldn't have been just better to keep the original decor uh, and the original hours, so closing at 2 a.m., and just change the bar stations, do some slight modifications. Um, it's obviously a different concept from our original idea, but it's not necessarily a bad one. Serving nice cocktails in an old uh, prostitute bar sounds, sounds quite cool, actually. So you should always, always listen to the walls, be flexible enough, <laughs> be flexible enough in your concept uh, so that if another possibility presents itself, you don't immediately dismiss it just because it doesn't fit within the strict image of what you wanted to do. Uh, be humble enough to recognize that your original idea isn't perhaps the best. Um, if we had done this, we would... Uh, probably have reduced our costs by about 100,000 euros at the opening. We would have paid, boss, paid off our investors by now, and we would have been actually making money at the bar uh, instead of breaking even. So there's no way really to know what would have happened if we went with this idea. Actually, there is. Uh, this is Dirty Dick. It's our friend Scotty Shooter's Tiki Bar, which is located directly across the street from us. This is the original facade he just changed uh, for a little 
um, tiki statue here, but otherwise it's original, original name as well. Um, and we actually passed over this space, which is bigger, has more original character, and costs the same price to get in. But um, we were pretty inflexible. We were very inflexible with our idea. We'd had some uh, sound issues with neighbors at Candelaria, so we were really fixated on this heavy soundproofing. And Dirty Dick uh, has a neighbor right upstairs, where Glass has an office upstairs that's empty at night. Uh, it also doesn't have the height, the ceiling height necessary to, to do the soundproofing to the level that we'd like to do. Uh, so we passed over that space, took a space about half the size for the same price, uh, because we were really fixated on this, on this uh, late night concept. Uh, he makes a ton of money. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, so instead, we forged ahead with the original idea, confident that we had a concept that Parisians would love and understand. Um, and we chose the same designers that we had used to great effect at Candelaria. Uh, they were quite inexperienced husband and wife team, but they had a great aesthetic. Uh, but unfortunately, we were about to learn the hard way that they, only, they were kind of a one-trick pony, and they didn't have the breadth of experience to produce uh, the kind of environment we were looking for at Glass. So they ended up hijacking the project and bending it towards what they wanted to do, rather than what we asked for. And this, uh, this uh, first era of Glass is the sushi bar area, era of glass. Uh, very clean, very clean wood. Uh, the furniture was uncomfortable, poorly designed. Um, never get an inex inexperienced furniture uh, designer. Uh, it's an art unto itself. Um, we wanted durable surfaces that were easy to clean and didn't have to re be replaced every six months, but unfortunately we sacrificed um, comfort in that. The design, uh, the bar was cold, angular, very zen, very smooth surfaces. It was just drywall painted over. There was no texture. Uh, and the designers actually, in the middle of, of doing glass, had just returned from a trip from Japan. So this really ended up influencing the original design. Uh, we, put, we put too much confidence in them, and we didn't, we didn't speak up, and we kind of believed in them that they would uh, deliver something wonderful, and it didn't really end up being that way. Uh, the light-up dance floor is admittedly pretty sweet, and that still exists. Um, it's the primary design feature of the bar. But uh, we ran into some bad luck with that as well, and the artist had some personal issues, so we didn't install it until about six months after opening. So this critical period where everyone's trying out your bar for the first time, uh, they were just basically walking into a black box. Um, not, very, not very warm or inviting. It looks nice in the pictures, but in actuality, it was very cold. Um, so keep in mind this pretty booth for a second as you're, as you're eating your sushi. Uh, we're going to get into glass version 1.5, which we call the Jammin' Alley Cat version of glass. Um, so in summer 2014, we had a, a freak out and decided to make glass into the real dive bar that we'd always wanted. Uh, we really needed to add warmth and make it feel lived in. We knew we wanted to renovate, but we didn't have the money to invest uh, in a designer, nor in, in grand, uh, uh, big changes. So we began a nine-month period of trial and error, designed by committee, quick decisions that didn't work out, and uh, really portrayed us as um, kind of a ship floating in the sea with no wind in its sails. The staff was also super eager to help out. We had a great staff at the time, and we still do. Um, and they were sick of long nights of serving fewer and fewer guests. So uh, before we left for Tales that year, we had um, taken off this kind of uh, really blonde sushi wood uh, wall, as well as in the back. So it was pretty bare. And um, one of our bartenders had a graffiti artist friend. And he's like, oh, do you mind? He's going to come in. He's an artist. Uh, he's going to tag up the wall and do something cool. We're like, OK, cool. You're, you're, uh, we have confidence in you. He's a cool guy. He's a musician and everything. So this is what we got. A um, <laughs> little bit too much liberty. Uh, this is the picture we received when, we, when, we're, at, when we're at Tails in 2014. Um, he's, a, he's a cool guy, huh? Um, there's his buddy. Yeah. So that was embarrassing. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, didn't last long, thankfully. We got home and we closed the bar to do the renovation, but fuck. 
Uh, so Glass version 2.0, the white album. We ripped out the mirrors. We took all the stuff off the walls. Uh, we exposed the beam in the middle because we just said, screw it, and we reduced the soundproofing there, but it was really cutting the room in two. Um, we closed in August of that year. We wanted to kind of reinvent the bar, put in some soft edges around the top, uh, add some texture to make a cozier space out of a soundproof box. Um, we used plaster to get a textured effect on the walls instead of the smooth black that it was before. We're trying to gain a little bit what was lost um, when, we, when we covered up the walls. Uh, and we're also thinking maybe it's too dark. Maybe that's the problem. No one wants to come in early. Why is that? So we left the walls unfinished, um, thinking that it would help bring in people earlier when they didn't feel like sitting in a black hole and the sun's shining outside. But it turned out that no one really liked it white either, especially late night. Plus, the plaster was poorly done and kind of splotchy and not all that great. Which brings us to today, uh, back to black. Uh, we painted it black again. We'd come to the realization glass is never going to draw on people as early as we want, so we stopped fighting against it. Uh, the white walls were also um, having the opposite effect. Uh, they weren't bringing in anybody early, and then they were scaring away our core customer base late at night who would come to think of glass as the late night destination, uh, late night alternative to the dance clubs in the area. This guy really loves it. Um, <laughs> So, which leads me to my final point, uh, which is something that we also discovered in our third venue, Mary Celeste, which actually uh, opened about five months after Glass. Um, there we thought we were opening a bar with nice food, and we ended up opening a restaurant with great drinks. So sometimes your guests will decide how the space will be used, and you can either fight against it and lose money in the process, or go with the flow and give people what they want. Once you open the door, the bar becomes as much theirs as it is yours. So we're never going to be the bar that fills up with crusty regulars drinking bourbon at 7 p.m., rubbing elbows with a group of girls drinking cocktails, or high and low meat, the classic dive bar, but dreams die hard. Um, but it's not all doom and gloom. This was at uh, the bar show last year in Paris. Uh, Glass has slowly been paying off its uh, investors and the bank loan. And we've toyed with the idea of selling, but the outstanding loan amounts are still too high at this point where uh, myself and Adam and Karina wouldn't realize any profit whatsoever for the last four years of work. Um, for us, identifying locational discord, inflexibility, and the design hijack as major reasons why I've been struggling has only made us better operators at our other venues and hopefully in our future endeavors. Uh, and most importantly, Glass is an industry and uh, a personal favorite. So sometimes it's irrational. Um, you follow your heart rather than the bottom line. And we're lucky enough to have a few other businesses that do a fair bit better than glass. Um, if it was our only venue, I don't know if we would have been, uh, if we would have had the balls to stay open this long or the money to stay open this long. Um, but as long as we can continue steadily paying off the debt uh, and have enough left over to keep the lights on, we're going to keep the party going. So thank you. Uh, Next up is Matt, and he's going to talk to you about Little Cleo Seafood Legend. I wanted to do this, though. I never get to use a laser pointer. Right on. All right. Oh, Lord. It's on. I'm live. Uh, good morning. My name is Matt Snap. I'm the beverage director for Fox Restaurant Concepts. I'm sure that that doesn't mean very much to most of you. Uh, I think that a lot of people think that uh, when you're running a big box beverage program that you spend a lot of time in a dark corner on your laptop. And so to translate it into kind of tails verbiage, just think that you land like a permanent consulting gig with a lot of work to do and a lot of different places to go. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh man, permanent consulting, that sounds like the jam. Uh, and it, it is the jam. I started with the company in 2004 uh, as a server in the Italian concept, North Italia. And uh, I became a bartender there and studied my wine. And then when we began opening kind of more aggressive, uh, a more aggressive set of restaurants, gastro pubs and uh, you know, healthy eateries, et cetera, I began doing my role now, which is you know all of the creative development, facilities uh, development, planning, etc., for uh, all of our all of our new restaurants, and and so on. 
So just for a quick snapshot, and I'm not going to read this to you because you have eyes, but we are uh, going, 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 growing, growing, growing. We have uh, the benefit of 14 different brands across eight states. The growth for 2016 includes uh, restaurants in Chicago, Pasadena, Palo Alto, Austin, Walnut Creek, Bethesda, and more. Uh, just for numbers sake, in 2015, we hit uh, just over 200 million in top line sales with 52 million of that in beverage. So we run about a 75-25. Uh, there are some uh, concepts that don't have a beverage program at all, and there are some that have a very small one, and there are some that have a very large one. So it, it really is a, it really is a, a large mix uh, to mess with. Uh, we showed we showed growth 30% uh, over 14, where we had 156 million and 39 million in beverage sales, which brings me. And then there was Cleo's, <laughs> and then there she was. So we opened Little Cleo's Seafood Legend, a uh, Brooklyn-style oyster bar in a landlocked state uh, in the middle of a 110-degree summer. And it turns out that people are wary of oysters and shellfish when it's 110 outside. <laughs> and in addition to, in addition to that, uh, we only gave them 10 or 15 parking spaces uh, for a total of 60 seats. So we, we, started, we started out a little bit rough. Uh, Sam Fox, who is our kind of our owner and creator and uh, restaurateur to the stars, uh, routinely goes to New York and this, he had just recently fallen in love with Maison Premier and so attempted to you know, do his own little twist of uh, Brooklyn meets the desert. And if we would have actually, <laughs> if we would have actually succeeded with it, we would have scared the absolute shit out of the desert. So <laughs> they, were not, they were not ready for it and we were not ready for them. So when you, when you see the building, it's got that, uh, it doesn't look anything like Maison Premier, thank God. Uh, but it's, you know, it's open and small, only 1,880 square feet. Uh, wrap around service style bar so you can watch the entire kitchen. Uh, we don't we don't have a walk-in. We just have a, a walk-by, as they call it. It's two Trollson doors where we keep you know a very limited amount of uh, supplies on hand. Uh, wine, beer, cocktails on tap. The largest selection of absinthe in Arizona, which is kind of a dubious honor because, to be honest, there's not a lot of people pouring a lot of absinthe, which is fine. I think we have 13 of them. No big deal. If you guys if you guys hustle, we'll still have all 13. So, in in the grand scheme of things, as you can see, with $200 million in top line sales as a restaurant company, $1 million of it can get swept under the rug and sometimes does. And because of our, because of our presence in the market, we don't get to spend as much time in this tiny little restaurant that is actually more of a passion than a paycheck for all of us. But running kind of this large and conglomerate empire, call it, uh, you need an outlet. You need a way to feel like you can get in there, reprint the menu at 11 o'clock, train the staff at 2 o'clock, and open at 5 o'clock, and feel, feel like the edgy restaurateur that you were meant to be, as opposed to sometimes getting lost in the minutia of rolling out 12 menus in six states over the period of a week and a half or two weeks. And so for a lot of us who who started with the company and are still at the company. We still have the same kind of nine people at the top there. There's two people on beverage and there's two people on culinary and there's Sam and his partner and then there's two people on operations. And so we sit in a tiny room and we make a lot of the decisions and we are successful enough, thank goodness, to allow our passion to stay alive despite the fact that it does not make two shiny quarters that you could rub together as far as profit is concerned. So uh, in the four walls, they make they do they do just fine. But as soon as you bring it below the line on the P&L, and you talk about some marketing expense and some PR expense, and we'll talk a little bit about what we do and why we why we allow it to continue to underperform as it continues to gently increase. Uh, once you bring it below the line, it it is in fact on paper a loss, but it's one of our favorite restaurants, one of my favorite restaurants, and I'm I'm probably there more often than than anywhere else because it, it feeds the part of me that, that isn't $200 million. I don't, get a, I don't get a big cut of that either. So, so one, of the, uh, one of the things, we're going to have a cocktail here in a minute. I think I'm probably talking way too fast, and the poor Caps team is looking at me like I'm crazy. Um, but we're going to have a cocktail in a minute, and it is a uh, lemongrass vanilla mule. 
And so one of the things that we started to do uh, when we realized that kind of, uh, you know, expensive, decadent, albeit New York style cocktails, uh, were not necessarily what our guest base wanted. They, they still wanted their Moscow mules. They still wanted their vodka based this is and that's. And so what we needed to do is create an elegant style of cocktail with a lot of thought, energy, integrity, and great ingredients, but that came at a lower price tag. Because one of the, one of the knee jerk reactions that sometimes people uh, and restaurants do when they start to slip and decline is they ask their guests for a bailout. And suddenly a $10 cocktail becomes a $12 cocktail with less ingredients. And then that $12 cocktail becomes a $14 cocktail. And now instead of having increased guest flow, you have decreased guest flow and a guest that's not. Is that for me? Thank you. Cheers. Oh, that's delightful. Uh, I, know, I know a guy. Um, so it's very important when you're beginning to realize that you've got a, a touch of a financial crunch that you have to up your game, not up the game that's coming to you from your guests, right? You can't necessarily say, uh, we're going to open for lunch. But then you're only going to staff one person for lunch, and then you have a terrible, that person has uh, too big a section, and that, et cetera, et cetera. And it becomes a very slippery slope that you want to save money while making money. You just need to keep the, you need to keep the flow going in the right direction. So let's keep talking about that. In any case, let's talk about the cocktail real quick while it's up here. So what we did instead was to take uh, a very nice and well-respected uh, vodka, the Islesberry, from the gentlemen that make it, uh, and then took, we have a very, a very good working relationship with our coffee and tea negociant. And so I went to him and I said, I need an hour alone in your tea, in your tea room, and I want to make something, and I want, to, I want to blend it together. I want it to be warm and rich, but I also wanted to have a, a touch of Asian flair to it. And so I blended a tea, a vanilla lemongrass tea, so now for the, the loose leaf tea, for 100 grams of it, we pay about $3. And with that $3, you can make about 85 ounces of syrup if you do it exactly right. And so now instead of having, you know, instead of having the time to muddle all that ingredients together and add the vanilla and this and that and this, you've got a, a ready to drink, ready to go syrup that will help you increase the level of perceived value, so to speak, in your cocktail while still keeping it under under a dollar cost. And that way you don't have to charge someone $12 for a cocktail that only costs you a dollar. You can charge them $10 and they can have two of them and then you win. Alrighty. Da, 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 da. So as you as you might imagine with a, with a restaurant group of our size we have uh, a fairly strong amount of resources both uh, front office and back office. We have probably 3,800 employees, give or take. And we have, we keep everything inside. We keep everything on an island so that we can continue to control it. And uh, I recently had a conversation with someone. And I said, do you think that because we're holding on so tightly that that's linked to us controlling our message and controlling our product and controlling our integrity as we move forward? Because I do. And if that's as successful as it is, then why on earth would we shop out our bar inventory? Why would we shop out our marketing? Why would we shop out our design? Why would we shop out our everything? And so we, we wake up in the morning and we live and die probably, probably too close to our own bubble sometimes. And that's, that's fair. That's fine. But when we internalize all of, our, all of our development and all of our marketing, then you can walk across the room and say, I want to talk to you about this. I want to talk to you about this. I want to talk to you about this. And everything's in the same place at the same time. So instead of increasing the day part or increasing the price, we said we just need to flash the bat signal and get more people through here, period. As soon as, as soon as people come in, we are standing there with our manicures and our shirts pressed and we're ready to rock and roll. Everyone has the knowledge. The food is always great. We just need more people. So you can't, 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 can't flash that bat signal and then be caught in your flip flops not ready to fight crime. It's, you, you can't. You can't do it, right? So we started with a happy hour for the absent-minded, where we were planning on, damn it, introducing and getting in a, like a cult following for absinthe. So all absinthe cocktails would be discounted. Dollar oysters, dollar shrimp, which again, when it's 110 degrees outside and you're landlocked, you're confused about that. But uh, we had everything flown in, so it was safe, I promise. Nobody had any problems. 
Uh, and this more or less didn't work. Okay. So we said, let's have events. Huh? Right? Let's do some events. Let's have a crawfish boil. We'll have a three piece jazz band, a lot of, you know, a lot of old bay salt. That's it. And this one worked. But it was incredibly time consuming and incredibly labor intensive and incredibly costly. Everyone had such a blast, but again, not a lot of money on that, right? Social media, I've got a big piece to say about social media, but the continued use of social media, not uh, as Josh was saying of showing pictures of you know, a full bar when you're actually empty or a full restaurant when you're actually a little closer to empty or the like, we decided to gear and tailor all of our messaging around the beauty of the building, the beauty of the program, the beauty of the cocktails, the beauty of the food, warm jar and a crab, or warm crab in a jar, jar and a crab, that doesn't work, warm crab in a jar, uh, you know, the cuisine is award winning, the Yelps are all five stars, the, all the feedback, all the local awards, the James Beard nods, the this, the that, the this, people need to be reminded. And so in the marketing, in the marketing side of it, they call it having an excuse to talk about yourself, because otherwise it sounds like bragging. This is an excuse to talk about yourself, an excuse to remind people, A, oh man, we haven't tried it, or B, remember when we tried that and we wanted to go back, but we didn't? We should go back. Everyone is inundated every day with so many flashing images of babies and dogs and cats and Pokemon and whatever the hell else. If you just slide your message in there with it, more often, it actually creates an imprint and have people come back. So we're, we're enjoying a little uh, social media success, but we've found that one-time events and long-time promotions aren't nearly as fun or exciting, both for the staff, which is important, you gotta keep your staff happy, or for the community as the legendary dinners are. So what better way to include the rest of the community than offering kind of like a, not a chef throwdown, but a chef partnership with local area chefs who are excited to come in and take their guests into our building. They're excited to grab some of our guests and, and share this direction backwards. So we've started pairing up with, with one of our own chefs and uh, you know local chefs, Aaron May, uh, Aaron Chamberlain, all these local chefs from Arizona that have a cult following, Chris Bianco, and having them come in and collaborate for a modest price, but it's event-based. It's experience-based. I tell, whenever I do training, as that permanent consultant thing we decided we're all gonna call it from now on, uh, whenever I'm doing training, I say, you're kidding yourselves if you think that all you're doing is selling tacos, burgers, pizzas, salads, wine, etc. You're not. We're all experience merchants, and that's what we're selling. We're selling an experience. And if you don't sell a whole experience, then someone's not going to have a whole experience. So if your lights are fucked up, or your music's too loud, or your food is too cold, or your drinks are too hot, or if any aspect of that experience is slightly askew, you're handing someone a tarnished, a tarnished thing. And so you need, you need the control of the facility, the atmosphere, the food, the wine, and the service to all be in line for that experience. So this is another, this is our corporate chef, handsome devil. Tattoos all the way down to his fingernails, you would never know. Uh, and he has, he has, we've now done six. We do one, one a month, and we've done six, and they've sold out 120 seats every single time. So we're experiencing this gentle, <laughs> very gentle sometimes, incline towards profitability. And I don't think that we will abandon that gentle growth for fast growth at any, at any point. We have to remind ourselves that it's a, it's a campaign, it's a marathon, it's not a light switch. If it was a light switch, I assume all of you would wanna know where it is, so we could just all flip it on and enjoy dancing and money or whatever people do when they have a bunch of it. Uh, but it's, it's a campaign, you have to wake up every day and you have, to, you have to make sure the lights are right and make sure the building's right, et cetera. You don't win a campaign on the first day and you don't lose it on the last day. We'll see come November, but. All right, so the only things uh, other than other than that, I'm never, being in that kind of permanent consultant role, I'm not, I'm not in the building when we talk about uh, closing or not closing, 
but I am in the building for just about everything else. And so I'll give you a few notes that we, that we kind of kick around on a day-to-day -day basis. And if any of these help you, then they say if you can reach just one. Uh, so bigger is only a little bit easier because business can hide inefficiency and mistakes with activity. You know what else business does? It makes you blind to behind you, right? So say that you're wildly successful and you're like, man, we are just living it and this is great. And oh, the, the bartenders are hammered again. Well, that's, that's okay. They're having a great time. They're making sure that their guests are having a good time, but maybe we'll want to keep an eye on that, right? So your business flow, now all of a sudden you're not as busy and your bartenders are still hammered. I'm not saying that we're all hammered right now or we're all bartenders right now, but we need to keep an eye on that, right? When, when it's raining, it's pouring. When it's just drizzling, you're realizing the leaks in the house. You feel me on that one? Okay. Embrace the duh. Teach everything you know to everyone you know as fast as you can. There is absolutely no good from having a piece of information that will benefit another person. You are not hoarding it for job security. That makes absolutely no sense. You are not the only person who can make the lemonade. Everyone can make the lemonade if you teach them. If you see someone making lemonade with salt, you should grab them and say, I've never seen that method before. Perhaps you'd like to watch me make it real quick. And let's embrace this duh moment. There's only three ingredients. It's sugar, lemon, and water. I see you've grabbed the salt. Let's try this again together. So you cannot, you cannot take a pass on someone making something incorrectly, doing something incorrectly, wandering past a piece of paper on the floor, piece of trash, smudged window, etc. Embrace the duh. Know exactly what you're buying and know exactly what you're selling. This seems like a moment of embrace the duh, right? If you pay attention to what everything costs and you know every time that you sell something what it costs or every time that something falls down and breaks what it costs, it will begin to influence your day-to-day -day maneuvers, right? And when you've got these brand new Perhaps you've, perhaps you've hired on a very hungry group of, uh, of bar professionals who are so damn excited they tasted VEP for the first time and now they put it in everything. Oh, it's in a bar spoon of VEP. Oh, good. Well, good. This is a vodka soda with a bar spoon of VEP? Yes, it is. That's uh, awesome. We're not going to put it on the menu, but I appreciate your fortitude. Realize that while you're not paying attention and you've charged them with developing the cocktail menu, that they went through 50 permutations of VEP cocktails without writing a single thing down, right? Know what you're buying, know what you're selling. And in addition to that, anyone who has control over a cost center or a, a piece of your money should also know what you're buying and know what you're selling. This doesn't mean that it, it's the Gestapo and you get a knuckle, you know, your knuckles bruised for spilling an ounce of rum or something like that, but everyone should be cognizant of what they're of what they're selling, what they're not selling. You should make a line in your P&L for creative development and make sure that you stay within that budget. It's not that, it's not, not rocket science on that one. Here we go. This is a good one. Keep your slash our guts to yourself and keep your money in the office. Literally on both of those, right? Don't keep your money out in the middle of the dining room or anything like that and keep your guts to yourself. But the, the other part is running a business is tough. And just running the business is tough enough without having people sleeping together or uh, stabbing each other with forks or doing all the other things that people do in restaurants. Like, oh, he's passed out in the bathroom, so let's work on that. That doesn't even have anything to do with the restaurant, right? But that's your guts. Those are your, those are your unsightly bits that you don't necessarily want your guests to know about. And so you gotta keep your guts to yourself. More importantly, as a team and a family, you have to keep our guts to yourself. Say that, say that there's a bartender in one of our stores that doesn't like a general manager of a newer store. It doesn't help anyone if they're leaning across the bar talking about what a piece of crap the new GM at so and such is, right? He's got to keep his guts and our guts to themselves. The other thing about keeping your money in the office, literally in the office, like a safe, the thickest one you can buy, spend that, buy that first. Uh, if it has a Dropbox, make sure it's clanky and rigid. Um, but keep discussions of money in the office, too. Because when you're a guest, if you're sitting there at the bar and you hear two people discussing 
uh, oh yeah, we're down 30 basis points over previous year. Our sales are 11,000. They should be 11.5, we're this and that and this. If I'm a guest and I'm listening to that, I have just been turned into a figure and not a person. And you don't, you don't work very hard to take care of your figures, right? You work hard to take care of your guests and then you manage your figures. Okay, it's a subtle difference there, but it's good. Here's your social media note. If a picture is worth a thousand words, an unbelievable experience is worth one million. So embrace social media, but rely on execution, hospitality, and charm. Quick story, we were in uh, New York recently and we went to 11 Madison because uh, a former employee of ours is the, one of the Psalms there, Andrew Rostello. And uh, he came over and was sitting there and we were talking about what a great rapport we had with uh, the bartender and what an amazing time we were having. And he said something, and I don't know where he got it from, I, I, I can guess, but uh, he said, we find that if execution is perfect, rapport can be anything you want it to be. Right? And we're listening to that going, yeah, we're you know, three quarters of the way full of bourbon at this point, but listening to that and going, yeah. And so we were giving the bartender a little bit of guff at the end of the evening. Oh, we'd love, we'd love to have a, you know, a nice rhetoric, one rock, please. I really wish I had an ice cold Miller High Life or a Bud, a Bud Heavy, just to have something to do with my hands while I'm here. And she has a canvas bag in her arm. We'd been talking to her about it for 10 minutes. She has a canvas bag in her arm. If anyone's with the legal world, we'll just like, la, 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 la. She went out to the bodega and got cans of Bud Heavy an hour ago because of Andrew Rostello told her to do it, and she'd had them buried in the ice for that entire time, right? So we're in 11 Madison, 11 o'clock at night on a Friday night, cracking Bud Heavies and drinking bourbon because their execution is perfect, their ambiance is perfect, the experience is perfect, so you get to build the rapport, right? And that's what people want, and that's what people want to come back for. That's the important part. Use the whole buffalo. Uh, this is, don't, don't waste anything. Don't, uh, don't put lemongrass in your cocktail if it's not already in the building, right? When you're getting ready to juice citrus, peel all the citrus first and start an oleo, right? Start an oleosaccharide first, juice the citrus second, and then make a welcome punch for people. Turn your trash into cash is kind of a, a quick way to say it, right? If whatever you're wasting, if you could have turned that into another penny or two, when a penny or two is really what you're monitoring, that's important, right? Our overall, our, our big kid numbers, uh, you know, we run a certain percentage and uh, 0.1 or a tenth of a point for the entire company is the entire operating budget for Little Cleos. One tenth of their point is like nine bucks. So when we sit down and we go over the P&L with everybody and they're off by two points, it could literally be $130. Like it could be somebody dropped two bottles of wine. So they are watching every nickel, every penny, every this, every that. The chef went to, uh, he shouldn't have, but he went to a refrigeration school to learn how to do minor upkeep on his own refrigeration because it was $100 every time he called the, the company that does that refrigeration. So little things, pennies. Make sure the beer is cold. Duh. Embrace the duh. This does not mean that make sure the beer is cold. It does mean to make sure that the beer is cold, though. So if you've ever had warm beer, or you've served a warm beer, and it's kind of that sheepish, like, there's still alcohol in it, it's still beer, I promise. But your guest is looking at you like, you don't even know how to make the beer cold? Ah. And then they don't trust you anymore. And they don't trust your recommendation for dessert. And they don't trust your recommendation for... Uh, a place to go afterwards. So they don't trust your recommendation for a coffee drink or an affogato or whatever it is, right? Because you can't even get the fucking beer cold. What? So one, keep make sure that the beer is cold. Two, it means be prepared for every shift like it is the only shift. Because newsflash, it really is the only shift. You can't fix yesterday's shift. You can't fix tomorrow's shift. But you can plan for tomorrow and you can execute tonight. Right? So if you make sure that the beer is cold, that means, is everything ready? Are we ready? Here's a shocker for you. Go into one of your bars or a bar that you're comfortable with and ask the bartender, what are the first three things that we're going to run out of? And they'll tell you, and it will be shocking. 
oh man, every day at 4.15 we run out of lime wheels. What? Why don't you cut some more lime wheels? Oh, you got it. Right on. Okay. Are you ready, are you ready for this shift? Yeah. What are we going to run out of? Lemon juice. What? Find some lemons and juice them. Let's get, let's get this going. Uh, and so those things uh, are things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis and kind of like our mantras and t-shirts and bumper sticker wisdom to try to keep everybody online and moving towards the right goal, which is delivery of an experience. And I assume that next year, uh, if I'm back here and anybody wants to find me and ask me, I assume that Clio's will be losing a little less money. Not making a lot of money, but losing a little bit less of it. So I thank you for listening. I'm going to hand it over to Ms. Julie Reiner. Uh, thank you so much. I like that we get the, do you want, the, you want your name tag? <laughs> That's okay. Refer to my name tag on the other side. There you go. All right. All right. How does this fancy thing work? Oh, there it is. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, so I'm Julie Reiner, and uh, I have been in New York City for almost 20 years now. And I have opened, uh, starting with Flatiron Lounge, uh, and then I opened Pegu Club with Audrey Saunders, uh, followed by Clover Club and then Lonnie Kai. Uh, so Lonnie Kai was opened in 2010 uh, and, and sold in 2012. And the partners were the same as Clover Club. Um, Susan and I and our initial partner who was a real estate guy. Um, in retrospect, really like what went wrong at Lonnie Kai can all be traced back to partnership issues. Um, and the issues of the business model are also directly related back to partnership issues. Um, now, my biggest mistake I think that I've ever made in this industry was signing a three-bar deal with this investor at Clover Club. Now, when we opened Clover Club, it was sort of like I, it, we, it was the concept and the name and the whole bit was all Susan and I and the investor was only involved in the build out and construction kind of stuff. And a little bit of design because he was a real estate guy who flipped places and had a lot of knowledge in that arena, but really didn't like trusted us to do what we do best. And that's why you know he got involved and this was actually somebody who I worked with when I first moved to New York and had kind of followed my career um, and I ran into him at Flatiron one night and said, you know, I'm really interested in doing something in Brooklyn. If you know of any spaces, let me know. And that was how this whole thing, and he was like, aha, my, the golden ticket, you know. <laughs> I was going to open three bars with him and make him all this money. Um, so we opened Clover Club. It's highly successful, great bar. And about a year in, he's like, oh, we got to do bar number two. And I really kind of wasn't ready to do that yet. I was still building Clover Club. It still had, we still had a lot to do there. Um, but, you know, in the back of my head, I was like, oh, well, you know, we, we have to open three bars with this deal. So let's, I guess, let's start working on this. Um, so he starts going out and looking at, at different spaces. There's me really happy at, the <laughs> at Lonnie Kai. <laughs> um, go. Um, so we, we start looking at spaces and he's bringing me into all of these different spots and they're all these big, really big spaces. So, you know, he's definitely thinking, you know, we're going to get some enormous space so that you can fill it with people and I can make shit tons of money. Um, and every time, you know, I go in this space, I'm like, oh, I don't know, you know, and there were mo many issues with, with the different spots. Um, and at that point, too, we had definitely had some, uh, some issues in, with our relationship at Clover Club where he, this is somebody who's in real estate where he goes in, you know, he, he gets something, he flips it, he sells it. It's like instant gratification, right? You make that, you make your money on real estate quickly. The bar business is not always like that, you know, so one year in, he's expecting the numbers to be much bigger than they were. Um, and then, you know, we were on Smith Street in Brooklyn, 
and we're busier than anybody else. And we're actually hitting our projections, but he wanted things to be expedited much faster. So there were already some sort of heated discussions and you know th suggestions that he had that we were like, no, we're not putting televisions in the back and doing, you know, all of these things that I was totally against and that didn't go with the concept. Um, so when a marriage is strained, you don't have a baby to make it better, right? <laughs> Don't do it. Um, another Lonnie Kai shot here. Uh, I'm not good with these PowerPoints. I should be moving it forward for you. <laughs> so the concept for Lonnie Kai, you know, we, we go into this space that, that I see. And uh, my first gut when I walked into this location at Lonnie Kai was, I don't know, it's really big. And it's kind of a weird location. And, at the end of the day, it was really big, and it was kind of a weird location. It's like, listen to your, listen to your gut. Um, the concept was modern, tropical, and tiki. So, but in the build out of the space and really like getting it going, two tiki bars open in New York City that I didn't know about. So, PKNY opens, and the Hurricane Club which are two very different kind of things. One, uh, you know, I'm sure you all know PKNY, Tiki Bar, East Village, and the other one is like Park Avenue, this massive space. And I'm like, oh shit, you know? Because <laughs> everybody had the same idea at the same time. Um, and, you know, I grew up in Honolulu, Hawaii, and so tropical, I had always wanted to do something tropical and kind of focusing on rum and, you know, tropical drinks. Um, but the design was going to be a little bit more like the way that they design hotels in Hawaii. So modern and classy, but still tropical. Um, and we, the downstairs is going to be a little bit more of a kitsch tiki kind of a, an idea. Um, but when we saw these two places were opening, we definitely went a little bit further in the modern tropical direction and away from kitsch tiki to differentiate ourselves from these other concepts that had just opened. Um, now the media, yeah, I start talking to the media and doing interviews, and it was really clear to me that they didn't get it. You know, it was like I, I'm, I found myself sort of talking more about what we weren't than what we were, which comes off kind of as a negative thing, you know. And there were things on Grub Street, just don't call it a tiki bar. Like, Julie will get upset, you know. But it wasn't, and I, it, I wasn't upset. I was like, I love tiki, but that's not really ultimately what we're trying to do here. Um, and then we opened and New Yorkers didn't get it either. <laughs> they just, how can tropical not be tiki? That was kind of like all they knew. Um, and it was, it was a tough, it was a tough thing. You don't want to open a place with that sort of negativity from the, from the get go. Um, now also on this space, we had a bigger, what is that? <laughs> What is that? That's not it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right. There was a much bigger, yeah. Thank you, Josh. The arrow forward. Um, there was a much bigger focus on food in this space than we've ever had before. Um, now, the partner wanted to be more involved in getting in, in how that what this was going to be right so he's comes in he I want a big menu and a wine list and you know this was not in my wheelhouse like, I don't I haven't opened full-on restaurants my name is synonymous with cocktails um, you know can I do do this in this space and actually fill it with people who want to eat here on, you know on a, on a regular basis um, and we didn't have a name chef you know we had a consulting chef, we were looking for a chef, we were having a really hard time finding somebody, doing tastings with different people, trying to get the right food concept um, was, was tough. Um, and all of our other bars are really like 70-30 beverage to food, which is, that's the, the magic number that you want. Um, and we, we were really playing catch up from day one uh, with the kitchen over at Lonnie Kai. Uh, the kitchen labor was a real financial drain 
and on the successful bar program and we just you know we're, it would have been a successful business if it weren't for this food issue that we had where we had to sell a ton of food to fill the place some of our lovely beverages. <laughs> uh, so this is the upstairs. Um, so when you first walked into the space, um, this was the upstairs, very restaurant, kind of like we put a bar at the end. Um, but on most nights, this looked very empty, you know, because it was a very big space. The bar downstairs, full all the time. And ironically, uh, that was kind of the same situation of the previous tenants. Bar downstairs, successful and busy. Restaurant upstairs, very hard to fill. And I knew going in that that was one of the issues that the people had before, because I had been there. Um, and so we thought, well, maybe if we, you know, we'll put a bar upstairs as well and kind of try to create the bar scene uh, on the, the main level. But it just uh, was never able to really make, pull its own weight. Um, so the location was also a problem. Like I said, I walked into this thing and my gut was telling me, you know, eh, I don't know, it's a weird location. It's technically Soho, but it's like on the edge of Soho and on this weird street that is kind of like, <laughs> it's, it's like going right into the Holland Tunnel. So nobody really kind of goes over there. You can't find it, you know. I mean, people are on their phones like trying to figure out where the hell it is. Um, and then it was a, a much bigger space than we had ever done. So 2,500 square feet, very large. Um, and it takes a lot of people to make that kind of a, that size of a space look full, you know. You don't, and, and people are walking by. The bar downstairs is full and having, people are having a great time. But people walk by, they look through the windows, and what they see is this, um, this space not very full at all, um, which was always kind of tough. Okay. Um, so the rent was $18,000 a month, which is very high. Welcome to New York City. Um, I was a personal guarantor on the lease, uh, which meant that, you know, if things didn't go well, I was liable for $100,000, um, which makes for a very stressful <laughs> situation <laughs> when you're not working with a large company. Uh, that you can pull from other areas to uh, help out. Um, and as a rule of thumb, I mean, for us, you want to be able to make your rent in one good weekend night. You know, that should be what you're looking for. Uh, and we weren't able to do that uh, at Lani Kai. And we, in retrospect as well, you know, we should have talked to the former tenants um, about some of the structural issues and repairs. So we get into this space and in the first year had $65,000 in plumbing. It, yeah, we were calling it Satan's asshole downstairs. <laughs> so we had, you know, it was like the septic tank thing in the back and, you know, we'd have Elaine and Philip Duff are there drinking Mai Tais and you know, we're in the back, like, you know, there's like this hole and it's like bubbling up with stuff and it was disgusting. And we had a couple times where it actually like flooded out into the bathroom area and it was really gross and very costly. And clearly the building, they, they definitely knew about some of this stuff, but once you, once you sign that lease, it's your problem to fix, right? Um, and it just crippled us because we didn't have, you know, the reserves to take care of that kind of stuff. But we had no, no option but to pay to fix it. Um, this is a, the downstairs bar, lovely fireplace, very modern. Um, so in the build out of Lani Kai, so we, we, we signed this lease, we get in there. The build out was very, you know, every time I look around Lani Kai, I just saw one compromise after the next um, because it was just a battle between us and the partner. So in, in the end, it didn't, it wasn't what I wanted at all. It wasn't what anybody actually wanted, you know, it was just 
a, it just looked like a push and pull to me. And there were so many arguments that the negative energy that I really feel, uh, you know, feeds a space. Um, you know, my experience with opening Flatiron Lounge was very, it was very organic and positive and everything really came together and it was just a great space and it opened and it felt good. And 12 years later, I go in there, it still feels good. It's got good energy. Um, and Clover was the same because there wasn't this arguing back and forth. It was kind of a vision that we all agreed on. And with Lonnie Kai, because we changed our concept kind of midstream and had to make all of these edits uh, and the partner wanted things that we didn't want, it just was a real battle. Um, and when I walked in day after day, it was like we opened the doors and I hated it. <laughs> <laughs> which I've never told anybody, but I did. I was like, fuck this place, you know? Um, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but yeah, I, and I finally, I finally got out of Manhattan and got to Brooklyn. I was like, what the hell am I doing? Now I'm, now I'm in Soho, it's even worse. Um, yeah. So there were a lot of tough arguments, not seeing eye to eye, and um, it, just, it just was not, not good all around. And then we had like these budget thing, the floral budget, you know, and a place like that with the concept, okay, we had a guy coming in to do flowers every week that was like $800 a week, you know, and when your septic tank is <laughs> overflowing, you're like, maybe we can do fewer orchids, uh, you know, um, uh, <laughs> yeah, so the financials of the space, my, my partner Susan has done all of the projections and the numbers uh, for all of our bars, and these are these are models are, are based on very intricate formulas. Um, what are we going to do on this day between this time, you know, at this time of year? And she's very accurate with these things. Um, and with all of the bars, we pretty much have hit those targets. So with the projections for Lonnie Kai, she did the projections. The partner looks at these projections and you know he's shopping investors, outside investors at this time, and basically changes all of her numbers. He's like, oh, you're, not, you're just not thinking big enough. Um, and just changes her numbers to things that really were not, I was like, I don't know if that we can actually do that. Um, but he sold somebody on his numbers, not our numbers, and you know, and therefore when we opened, we had to totally alter what we were doing. Six weeks in, he wants to launch brunch and lunch. Six weeks. We're still trying to get our feet, you know, planted and work on the nighttime business, which was good, but could have been better. And ultimately, you know, these are very costly services to do with the kitchen uh, and the staff, and we weren't doing anything well at this point because we were all way just stretched way too thin. Um, and like what you were saying, you know, we have one bartender. You know, I, I'm I'm coming in basically to work lunch because there's nobody coming in for lunch uh, instead of being there at night when people want me to be there. Uh, and I have a bartender who I'm training and paying to be there because there, there are no customers to tip this bartender, you know. Um, and it was just too, too soon, way too soon. Um, and ultimately, it just kind of was a snowball effect um, that was crashing and burning very fast. One of the good things that happened out of Lonnie Cause, this is Brian Miller downstairs at the downstairs bar dressed as a pirate. Um, um, yeah, so be realistic with your financials. It's not going to help anybody if you have numbers that you are not going to be able to to meet. Uh, and don't let don't don't let a, a, a partner bully you into changing those things because at the end of the day, you're lying to the person who's lending you the money. And the 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 guy who ended up losing out in this whole thing was the investor who didn't end up getting all of his money back. Um, so the partner at, at, that we had basically got, you know, upset and kind of disappeared, went, went traveling for a couple months, um, while Sue and I worked on trying to get the place 
going. We launched Tiki Monday there in the downstairs bar, um, which you know Brian Miller at the time was came in and was had it wasn't really doing anything, and he's sitting at the upstairs bar and we really needed something and he needed something to do. And I was like, hey, Brian, why don't we do a tiki night? Because people want tiki, <laughs> you know? Um, and so we launched Tiki Mondays with Miller, uh, which is still going strong and has, has done some amazing things for tiki cocktails and tiki culture. Um, and is one of my favorite things that came out of, came out of the bar. Uh, so the, he came back from his travels and decided and was like, I'm going to sell Lonnie Kai. And we convinced him to let us stop doing lunch and brunch, focus on the night for a while, uh, and see while, while he's looking into selling the place. And you know, at that point, he wasn't talking to me at all. <laughs> he would only communicate with Sue, uh, mainly because you know, Sue and I, she would say things to me and then I would just mouth off to him and say the things that she had said, but, <laughs> but she wouldn't actually say them to him. Um, so he would only communicate with her, uh, which became a very unhealthy kind of environment to work in. You know, at the, We could have moved this bar to another spot that was smaller. Had we done it in a smaller location, it would probably still be open. But it was not, the space was just way too big for the concept uh, to, to hold up. So we started looking into selling the place. And you know, in New York, that's kind of a tough thing because when the public finds out that you're selling, it's like the kiss of death. The whole staff quits. You're on death watch on Eater, uh, you know, <laughs> it's, um, which is, is tough. And uh, so we kind of had to like list it in places where it wouldn't be seen you know, by other industry people. We really couldn't tell a lot of the staff, some of the management, we let them know that we were thinking about this um, so that they could kind of look into some other things. Um, but with the partnership as strained as it was, we really needed to, to sell. Um, so we did end up, this was a Tiki Monday downstairs when it was actually happy. <laughs> we did find buyers uh, for Lonnie Kai. Um, who ended up in that space for a year before they ended up closing. I was like, oh, we lasted twice as long. The space itself, I think, it ha is uh, a bit cursed. Um, but uh, we were able to pay off all of our vendors, pay all our, all of our employees, and, and as well as our management, and give them a little bit of a severance. Um, and then I took a lot of the staff that were, you know, my top people at Lonnie Kai out to Clover Club, who, and most of them are still are still at Clover Club. Um, and yeah, the biggest lessons for me that I've learned in the bar business have come from the things that haven't worked and the things that are tough. You know, when you know when things are going well, and you're like, yay, good for us! Look, our bar is full every day. You can kind of sit on your laurels. There are no you know, it's not like, oh, how are we going to pay this bill? You know, things are things are going well. Um, this is more the Tiki Mafia outside of of Clover. Um, some of the the things, you know, it's like a lot of the, the good things that came out of Lonnie Kai for me were were you know, Ivy Mix worked there. I brought her out to Clover, and she learned a lot from watching that, as well as um, opening, you know, when we opened Leanda, she really had learned about a place that didn't work, and then she was at Clover, and a place that does work. So that was really good. Um, and then I also launched my consulting company because I couldn't pay myself <laughs> out of Lonnie Kai, and so, and that's still going as well. Lessons, lessons learned. I'm gonna let Hendrik, Hendrik get up here. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Are we on here? Yeah, we are. Thank you, Judy. And uh, thank you for leaving me 10 minutes to do this, but I'll be fast. <laughs> it's rockets. 
Uh, my name is Henrik. I come from Copenhagen, and for five years I ran a little bar called Molkes Bar, uh, 2009 to 2013. The funny thing with it was that it was hidden in an old palace, deep inside, uh, and it came up as a project as the bar was 50 years old. It was established 50 years before, but never opened. It was about to open that space. Uh, together with eight guys, we set that up for, let's do it. Uh, those guys were not bartenders by trade, and it was not their choice of career. But it was a job to earn some money. Uh, and we, we did that pretty successfully. Uh, wow, there's a lot of thing going on here, sorry for that. The bar was there, so we, we shouldn't spend money on, on making anything ready like Julia and, and, and um, Josh has, has done. It was all there, we should just fill it with people and, and, and a good hospitality. And we did, and we became a successful bar uh, based on a New York inspired classic cocktails only. That was our niche. We didn't invent any cocktails. They were all about the classic, which was new at that time. Four years later, we reached our uh, expiration date. So let's talk a little about the expiration date uh, to catch up a little. We, there's expiration dates to everything. Your job, all you're sitting there, do you have the same job today that you had four years ago? I think a lot of you have changed the job. We always change your marriage, your relationship. The cocktail that we had from, from Matt, it's all gone, it expired. Uh, your box of milk, it will have an expiration date. And your bar too, that is national. If we open 10 bars today, we know that in one year, two or three has closed. In five years, half are gone. In 10 years, only a couple has survived. So to be closing something, we call this sing, swim, or get out of the pool. Getting out of the pool is not a failure. We had just have to work with it. It's like death and taxes. It will come to you. When it's time to reconsider, yes, we look at the till of the cash register, uh, but I'm a former banker, and I know you can look somewhere else as well. So no or declining, yes, of course. That's the bad sign, you have to rethink. Regulars don't come back. That is the sign that you have to be aware of. Why don't they come back? Uh, poor tipping. In Denmark, uh, tipping is, is, is not a thing that you have to do like you do here, but poor tipping, people are not happy when they come here. It's time to rethink. Uh, the guest behavior, uh, like uh, Joshua said, it's changes. Who owns this bar? Uh, location, foot traffic, Julie, you are into that with the Lanikai. I know the place, I've been there a couple of times. It was a crazy location, street-wise. So if something happens in your neighborhood and the location is not that adorable anymore or the foot traffic changes, think, will that affect on my bar? The new black in town? <clears throat> are we on top of what is in right now? And of course the staff. Why did we close Marcus Bar? It was about the staff. They were on their way to other careers. We could have done a generation two at Marcus Bar, but that gave me time to think, how about the other things? We had not a turnover declining. We still had our regulars come back. Poor tipping, it's not a big issue in Denmark. Guest behavior was fantastic location, the new black in town. We were a niche. We only had the classic cocktails. That was what we are known for. What about tomorrow? There will come a new black. Will our regulars go to that new black? Maybe. At that time, cocktail bars were booming up in Copenhagen. So to find staff that wanted to work only two days a week because we were only open Friday, Saturday, it could be hard. And we will face a lot of competition out there, and I love competition, but we were at a state that I said, maybe we should get out of the pool. 
while it's still fun. So, I don't know. <laughs> Julie? But it's hard to make that decision, and it was hard to me. The only guy that wanted to stay there and be behind the bar is Mark, that is <laughs> at the door over there. He's my fellow. I didn't buy the T-shirt to him. Um, but going through that uh, process, love makes you blind. Julie, you hated Lanikai. It was not hard for you. At Marcus Bar, we loved our bar. So it was hard to us. You have to consult third parties for help because you are blind in making your, your decision. If you have financial partners, go to them. Not for money, maybe just for good advice so you can carry on. And, and the earlier you go to your financial partners, et cetera, et cetera, the better they can help. You have to be honest. Uh, to your staff, financial partners again, uh, to your regulars. We are going downhill. We might close soon. Uh, so be honest. And be honest to yourself. Don't blame others. I've seen so much about the landlord is an a-hole, asshole, I think I can say here, because Elaine sitting down there who uses that word all the time. Uh, no, you didn't read the contract or the lease, for God's sake. It's not the landlord that is an asshole. That was twice. Uh, involve your staff. <laughs> involve your staff. Never go alone. If you're honest to your staff, they will walk with you. Um, so let's move on to see if we can catch up on time. And yeah, do a, bu uh, a budget. I'm an old banker. So I have seen so many budgets, ideas. Will you please then give us a loan or, or support uh, our, our project here? And we see budgets, but you need budgets. And Judy is here. You should have brought Susan. I have met her for a seminar. She knows to work with numbers. You have to work with numbers when you are up against the wall as well. Make a free tier budget. What happens when you just go on as it is. When will we reach the inevitable expiration date? You can figure that out. And don't think that tomorrow will be better than today. It won't. And don't blame national TV for bringing one big grand finale of Dancing with the Stars or whatever. There will be a show every Saturday. Don't blame that. Don't blind yourself. Make a rescue operation budget. What shall we do? Like Joshua, we have to remodel, et cetera, et cetera. What's the cost? What do we believe in will come in, et cetera, et cetera. And make a mark for when Plan C, the closing budget, should go in effect. You have rainy day funds, but will not last forever. So make a clear plan when we reach this point according compared to the budget. Now we take the decision. Think about a plane crash. At some time you have to decide, now I have to get out of this plane before it's really too late. So prepare for a crash. It can happen. Soft closings. It's the worst thing this came off from Philip Doff. He sent it to Josh and I. I said, oh, it's about your seminar, Henrik. Put that on and you're good. Uh, people are talking about a newly opened restaurant in, in Hong Kong, I think it was. Should we go? They might close soon. Maybe we should go there early. If that comes out, you are closed. And lately, a couple of weeks ago, Anna's Gastro Bar closed. They opened for five days in New Orleans. There was the, the brains behind that gastropop and the financial partner, their contract wasn't in order. He didn't want to pay the money. They had opened for five days. The employees don't get their 
their money, et cetera, et cetera. Money wasted on decor, et cetera, et cetera. We feel so sorry for that guy who made that gastropod. I don't feel sorry for him because he didn't do his work in time. So if he came to me and I was a banker, I would say, no, 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 not one more time. You, you don't do your job very good. I will promise you a happy ending. I will look forward to that. <laughs> you have to plan your closing. Uh, when Julia closed Lanikai, it was overnight and there was a lot of stories out there. And I knew about Julia and I think, who is she? Suddenly it's, it's closed. I came home with, on a flight from Honolulu, something like that. Grab everything that's left because we're closing tomorrow. I go for a planned closing. Involve staffs and, and, and regulars and make your closing a happy ending. We had had fantastic time at Malkus Bar. We had regulars. We want to say goodbye in a nice way. Um, so do that. So what did we do? <laughs> we bought a picture. <laughs> yes, you, if you want on the stage, you can you stay there? <laughs> No, we, we, we're getting close now. We made a, a, a happy ending. What, what, yeah, what, what, what we did, uh, we knew it six months in advance. So all that worked, we got used to the facts we are closing. And uh, five weeks before the closing, we popped the news. We do a lot of events at Marcus Bar at that time. All those events and seminars, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, we bunch them together to a kind of Morgan's Bar greatest hits. So every weekend there was an event, and the bar was open. The very final night, uh, can we go a little back? The very final night, uh, we invited regulars only. That has been supportive to us all the time. We want to say uh, goodbye in a nice way. They were all handed and a bottled cocktail, the old pal, with a little, hey, we love you, take this with you home. And we did a full bar for until midnight. And we were New York inspired. So we invited their fellow over, Mr. Handsome, uh, to say, we close our bar at midnight. Will you run the bar from midnight and until guest goes home? so they can see where we got our inspiration from. And that was our treat to the regulars. See, we all talk about Jeff Bell, person live making cocktails. He, he had two options. You can bring a fellow bartender or you can bring your girlfriend. I bring my girlfriend. He was working his ass off. That was the third time. <laughs> and everybody loves us for it. And I think we should go Quick, so Joshua can push something. Being shut down, that is a boomer. Plan out your, your closing. That could be a thumbs up. What are we doing today? Uh, writing on a book, we had done it for a long time, I know. We do still a lot of events because the bar is still there because it belongs to the palace where I, I, I work every day. Uh, we do tons of cocktail classes for the com consumer, et cetera, et cetera. We still got emails like, oh, would you be bartender at our wedding, et cetera, et cetera. So all our old friends, they are still true to us. So yes, we are not open Fridays and Saturday, but we are still working. And one of the things we're working with uh, is a book about the history of cocktails in Copenhagen in the 1900. And we need a new slide, Josh. So in that, we found a cocktail called One School 1936. Say after me, One School 1936. OK, One School in your language means uh, county fair, cattle show, whatever. And every year in the old, old, old days, uh, they had this uh, county fair. And they made a cocktail for the county fair in 1936. Tanqueray, Benedictine, Grand Manier, Noir de Bras, and a little mist of absinthe. Uh, 
and that's what we're working with now, digging into the Danish. We're not a Danish David Wondrich, but somehow figuring out what is going on, what is our legacy back in time. So that is a new job. So we are still working with Liga in, et cetera, et cetera, and we're looking forward to that. And I think, Joshua, you should close it all. Thank you so much.